There's a quote that I heard years ago, and I've heard various people say the same quote that I've always remembered. It's the quote that says, if someone ever tells you he's a self-made man, he's not much of a man. Or we could change it a little bit. If someone, man or woman, tells you he's a self-made or woman's a self-made woman, she's not or he's not much of a woman. And we know that is true as we hear that quote, as I see some of your heads nod a little bit. We know that we can't do much in life without others. That we usually have to rely on what others have done before us and we built on it. We have to rely on what others have given to us and then we make more of it, more of it. Yet though we know that we, you know, even though we know that, we still try things on our own strength. We try things under our own willpower, even though we realize we need others and their help. Maybe it's an American culture thing or maybe a human thing, but we like to do things on our own. We like to make things happen because of what we do. We like to go it alone and try things alone. We often try to do things on our own strength. And this sometimes includes trying to do things without God's strength and without God's help in our lives. We sometimes fall into the habit of making a goal and charting a course, and then we start pursuing that course, and we get towards the goal in our attempts to pursue it, and then we realize we never asked for God's direction or God's provision along the way. So let me ask you, have you ever tried to go at life alone? Have you tried to do and achieve significant things without asking for God's help? Have you tried to be your own boss in life? And how did that work out for you? We're going to see here today in this passage that Pam read for us, a group of disciples that are starting to go about life on their own without consulting God. And in the process, Jesus provides for these disciples in their time of need, and they learn that they need him. And in that process, Jesus uses their failures to show his glory to them. Just a little reminder, if we enter the minds of these disciples and kind of think through some of the things they've been through in the past couple of weeks, they participated in that triumphant entry that we celebrated today where Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and people laid down palm branches. The disciples were with Jesus and watched that ha happen. The disciples expected a new kingdom to come because of Jesus and his work. But just a few days later, Jesus is betrayed by one of their friends, Jesus. A short time after that, they are almost arrested with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when 600 soldiers show up to arrest Jesus. And Jesus tells the soldiers, you're here for me. Then they got to learn about their leader, Peter, and his denial of Jesus. And they undoubtedly saw and if not also heard about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then heard about his empty tomb later. And as John tells these stories one after another, and he's taking us through here, we're kind of in the middle of five different appearances of Jesus in his resurrected body that the apostle John tells us in the gospel of John. First, he shows up to a woman named Mary Magdalene to her first. Then he shows up to the group of disciples, 10 disciples without Thomas. Then he shows up again a week later to those disciples with Thomas present. And then we're here where Jesus appears to these seven disciples as they're out fishing. The fourth of the five appearances out of about 10 total, if you read all of scripture, Jesus appeared about 10 different times to different groups after he came back from the dead. And we're starting chapter 21 of John, which is a conclusion chapter, or an epilogue to his writing. Last week, kind of the apex of the book was at the end of chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, where John says that he wrote all of these things so that people would believe in Jesus. Then he continues on with a few more stories and a few more words to conclude this gospel about Jesus. 
And so as we read John's words here, we're going to look at the failure of the disciples, the favor they enjoy when Jesus shows up, and the deep fellowship that they experience because of Jesus in their lives. So let's first look at their failure, starting in these first three verses. John writes, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Verse 1 from John here is just a brief introduction to kind of orient us to what's going on in this last chapter. He mentions that this happens after these things, which is a vague reference in time. It's not specific like eight days later, as he's told us before. So this is about, it's less than a month later than these previous appearances of Jesus. The ESV says it happened after this, or the NIV, it says afterward. Very kind of a vague reference. He describes the time, and then he describes the place here. He says they were, the disciples were again at the Sea of Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. Now in Israel, there are two seas. There's a Sea of Galilee in the north, and then the Dead Sea in the south. I always remember it because the water flows from north to south. It comes from the Sea of Galilee, and then it dies in the Dead Sea. That's my memory hook that helps me remember. Galilee is that northern body of water, the Sea of Galilee. If you're reading the NIV or the NLT, they just say the Sea of Galilee to make it a little clearer what's being described here. And John names the disciples for us. He names Simon Peter first, because Simon's usually the leader of the crowd, the disciples. He names Thomas, called Didymus, meaning the twin. He names Nathaniel of Cana. Those are the three he names. And then he gives two groups of two men, the sons of Zebedee. That's likely John, the writer of this gospel, and his brother James. And then the two others possibly were Andrew and Philip, who are known to be from this area and often referenced together. And these seven disciples that John names, they're going to go fishing. And they're following the direction of a man, the decision of a man. Verse 3 says, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. That's the first person singular pronoun. Simon Peter's decision that he was going to go fishing. Now, fishing at that time was usually done at night, a good time to fish. It was done with a torch in the boat. The boats were about 15 feet in length normally, and they would fish with nets that had weights on the outside of the net, so you could throw the net out, let it sink, and then you would drag it up and fish, as these guys were doing. But why would Simon Peter and the others decide to go fishing? Some people would say that they are returning back to their previous vocation, that they are kind of abandoning Jesus' call on their lives, and they're returning back to their old ways. And I think if we said that, that takes what's being described a little too far. It's not really clear that they have abandoned Jesus and are leaving Jesus' call to return back to their old ways for a couple of reasons. One, Jesus had told them in Matthew and in Mark he had told them, go to Galilee, and I will meet you there. So they're possibly in that region following Jesus' instructions. A second reason is that there's nothing wrong with going fishing so you can eat. There's nothing wrong with fishing so you can make some money and pay your bills. So I think they likely, they're just looking for some food to eat. They're looking for some money to provide for themselves while they're waiting for Jesus to show up in Galilee. And John tells us what they caught. They caught nothing. Growing up in rural California, I don't know about the language here in Washington, we called that you got skunked. Is that a thing in Washington, you got skunked? I grew up in the foothills, so there were a bunch of lakes where all the snow would melt, and we went to New Maloney's and Camp, uh, Comanche Party, 
you didn't want to get skunked. They didn't catch anything, not even a bite, not even a fish that was too small to keep because it was illegal, not even a rare fish that they would have to throw back. They didn't catch anything. And what we learn here in these first three verses is that when we operate in our own strength, we achieve nothing. And let's consider this scene from their point of view. These guys, they grew up in Galilee. They knew this region. They knew the best spots on the Sea of Galilee probably to fish. And not only did they know that, but they had fished for a living. This was some of their jobs, their own profession that they would use to provide for themselves. And not only that, it says they fished all night long and they caught nothing. I tried to point this out in verse 3 a little earlier. But Peter said to them, I am going fishing. There's been no prayer, no direction, no spiritual sense of what was right and wrong. Peter just seems to decide on his own authority, I'm going to go fishing. It reminds me of a story in the book of Joshua where Moses has passed away. He commissions Joshua, his assistant, to take the Israelites into the promised land, and they enter the promised land, and things are going good. They're taking area by area. They're fulfilling God's promise to them to take this land that he has given to them. And word gets out that there is this God that is with this unique group of people, the Israelites. And there's a group of people that hear about them coming and taking over all these areas, and they come up with a pretty ingenious plan. They're in the region. They know the Israelites are going to come and take. So they say, let's dress up in really old, beat-up clothes. Let's find some old, moldy bread. And we're going to travel to the Israelites. And we're going to say, we're from this land way over here. And let's make an agreement and make them promise they will never conquer us, even though they lived just over the hill in the promised land. My friend Sam Secord showed this to me in seminary. I've never forgot it and have highlighted it in my Bible. But after those people arrived to the Israelites, it says, So the men of Israel took some of their provisions, those are the gifts these guys offered to the Israelites, and did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. That was one of two sins that prevented the Israelites from fully taking the land God had promised to them. It was their decision to interact with those people and take their provisions without talking to God. It was Peter's decision to go fishing without asking for God's direction. See, Jesus has a lesson he wants to teach these disciples and to teach us that we can't do anything without him being involved in our lives. And that's something I know we can feel and sense, right? If we're having trouble getting along with our boss, it's tough to make things work. Maybe we have friends that seem to get upset with us no matter what we do or say. Maybe family members that don't want to interact with us. Maybe we have health issues that don't seem to go away. Or school doesn't seem to work out like we planned it. When we try to combat those issues without God's help, they rarely work out and get solved. When we do things without th God, things don't work out well. And the disciples are learning that lesson here. And Jesus has a specific lesson he's going to show them in the next few verses, starting in verse 4. But when the day was now breaking... Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, do you not have any fish? Do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. And they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. 
But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. As Jesus shows up here, it is dawn, it's early morning. It says when the day was breaking, the NIV says it was early morning or just as the day was breaking. He shows up and he asks them a question. Or before he asks them a question, he addresses them. He calls them children in verse five. The NIV says he called them friends. This Greek word that he uses that John places Jesus's words in is paideia which is one who is treasured in the way that a parent treasures his or her child. It's used as a form of familiar address on the part of a respected person who feels himself on terms of fatherly intimacy with those he addresses. Jesus reaches out to the disciples in a lovingly concern, saying, little lads, children, And he asks them a question, which he knows the answer to, because John puts his words in a way that that expects a negative answer, the way he frames it in the Greek text, text. Jesus says, children, you do not have any fish, do you? Jesus knew the answer to the question before he asked. Then he gives them some direction. He says, cast the net on the right side of the boat. We can imagine the disciples reply, really? We've been here all night. You don't think we've tried that before? Really? That's only like eight feet difference. You think there are going to be fish on that side that aren't on this side? So they cast. They obeyed him and did what he asked. And they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. And that's where we learn that John, the apostle, the writer of this, recognizes it was Jesus. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, the apostle that wrote this, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, so he put on his outer garment, for he'd stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. John is sensitive to Jesus, and he's sensitive to spiritual things, and he recognizes this must be Jesus that makes this happen. And Peter acts like we normally see him act. He jumps in as soon as he can, just like going to the tomb. Mary Magdalene got there. She looked in. John got there. He looked in. But it says Peter got there, and he walked into the tomb. We see Peter act that same way. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging that net full of fish. See, Jesus is teaching them that without me, you guys can achieve nothing. But with me, when you operate and follow my direction, you can achieve anything that I want you to achieve. When we operate in God's direction, we can accomplish anything that God wants. And we saw that here with these guys, their need, they've got no fish. They're in a lake that they know and understand. They're doing a trade that they were skilled at. They needed Jesus. They were available. They were ready for him to intervene. A simple suggestion like toss the net to the other side. They obeyed because they were desperate and they needed help. They were in a position where they were willing to do anything that might fix their solution. See, this lesson is something Jesus had told those same disciples just a couple of weeks earlier. In John 15, 5, and that night before Jesus' crucifixion, he told them in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. He had told them about it in the past. Now he is showing that to them in the present. He's teaching them, when you guys operate and follow my instructions, you can do anything that I want you to do. 
and them as they are being commissioned to go out and spread the gospel and preach to the world, they are being prepared to rely on Jesus each and every day for his help to do that. I was at a coffee shop downtown a few months ago, and I was just making some chit-chat with the gentleman that worked there. There was no one in line behind me, and I had some time to kill. And so I was just talking to him, you know, is this your only job? Do you do other things? Do you have a, you know, are you in school? Or just kind of asking him what his story is. And he said, well, I just went to Big Bend, and I got my AA degree, and I'm finished. I'm trying to decide if I want to go on and get a business degree or if I just want to start working. And he said, how about you? He doesn't know me or anything about me. He says, how about you? What do you, did you go to college? Do you use your college education? You know, do you, does it rely? Do you learn and use from your college now? And I had to tell him, I'm not sure if I'm the best one to ask. Because I literally use everything I use, I learned in college every single day. Probably every hour. I'm often rereading books they had us reread in school, trying to sharpen my understanding of scripture and theology. I use things they taught me about how to work with the board and leaders in the church all the time, how to care for people. I had to tell them, for me at least, I use what I learned every single day. And I find myself going back to try to relearn the stuff I never learned or I forgot. And that's what Jesus is telling these guys here. You're going to need to rely on this every single day. When you go out, you're going to need courage to preach the gospel. When you preach the gospel, you're going to re need to be ready for persecution and opposition. You need to rely on me when that happens. When you face these philosophers or Jewish leaders that are going to oppose you, you're going to have to rely on me to help you get through those issues. And there's an application there for us today. That when we follow God's will for our lives, when we seek his will and follow his direction, we're going to accomplish anything that he wants for us to accomplish because we're following his will. See, God will take our struggles, he'll take our disabilities, he'll take our inabilities, and he will transform them. He can do great things for us when we are willing and available to follow him. And that's a lesson John has tried to show us throughout this gospel. When Jesus is at a wedding and someone has planned poorly and all of a sudden they're out of wine and there's still several more days of this wedding celebration, Jesus takes what they have and he transforms it into wine so that the host wouldn't be embarrassed. When a royal official comes to Jesus and says, my son is sick, Jesus heals the son. When Jesus meets a paralyzed man at a pool that had been paralyzed his whole life, he takes his struggles of not being able to walk and he tells him, pick up your mat and walk. When people are hungry and they just have a few pieces of fish and bread, Jesus takes the little bit they have and he makes more of it. When the disciples were on the water and they think they're going to die on the sea and it's crazy, he calms the sea. Jesus takes all of those different issues, the struggles that people were in, and he uses them to show his glory and his majesty. A recent example of that is a guy named Robert Reichs. You might not know his name, but you're familiar with his work. He was a newspaper man, just an everyday guy. But he was a Christian man, and he loved God, and he loved kids. And he lived in London in a time where kids were put in factories, and they were worked hard six days a week. They weren't really cared for. They were pushed, they were pushed, they were pushed. They never got to go to school. They didn't get to learn. They never had any other opportunities in life besides working in a factory. And Robert came up with an idea. What if we started teaching these kids basic things like reading, writing, moral education, and manners on Sundays? So he started what they called a Sunday school class. In 1780, they had 90 students in Robert's Sunday school class that he had started. Three years later, they had 250,000 students in the Sunday school classes that Robert Reich started. 
31 years later, they had 400,000 students in London in these Sunday school classes. 55 years later, which was 20 years after he had died, they had 1.5 million students going through Sunday school classes on Sundays, helping kids learn reading and writing and morals and manners. Not just a million and a half students, they had 600,000 teachers. Most of them were women that were getting to learn and grow too and experience teaching that bettered their lives too. Just an everyday guy that knew God loved children and wanted what's best for them. When we operate and follow God's direction, we can achieve anything because it's what he wants us to do. So we've seen these disciples, their failure in fishing. We've seen the favor they enjoy when they listen to Jesus and they show up. Lastly, lastly we see this fellowship that they experience. Perhaps the most important part of these 14 verses isn't what happened on the sea, but what happens here on the shore. And we see a meal waiting for them in verse 9. When the disciples, at least the disciples minus Peter, get to the shore. So when they got out on the land, they saw charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Breakfast is ready. Jesus has got it there ready for them when they arrive. And they get to enjoy this meal with them in verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught, he tells them. See, Jesus wants us to contribute to the things he go has going on in the world. He wants us to add to the things he's already doing. Chuck Swindoll in his commentary on these verses says, while the Lord can do all things without any help from anyone, he invited Peter con to contribute the fruit of his efforts the Lord wants to enjoy the victory we accomplish together, not because he needs us, but because he wants us. Simon Peter went up and drew net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn, it says in verse 11. John's pretty specific to mention 153 fish that they caught. Now, as I read scripture, I normally follow the kind of the plain literal reading. 153 fish to me is 153 fish, at least as I read it. But there would be, and this is something that we expect of someone that was an eyewitness account like John. He could give a specific number if he was there. Not only that, we know fishermen always know how much they caught, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're professional fishermen, they're going to have to split this among themselves. So they're going to have to count it as well. But there was a period of the Christian church starting in the fourth century that would follow more of a symbolic interpretation, more of an allegorical interpretation. Augustine was a fourth century theologian from Africa. He said this was not 153 fish, but instead it was a reflection of the numbers 1 through 17, if you add all of those up, that equals 153. And that symbolized the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament and the seven gifts of the Spirit. Interesting theory. Another guy named Cyril of Alexandria, he worked hard to teach the, the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ. But he, when he came to this, he said the number 100 represents the Gentiles, 50 represents the remnant of Israel, and then three represents the Trinity, was his interpretation. Or Jerome, who spent 23 years translating the Old Testament from Hebrew and the New Testament from Greek into Latin, what we call the Vulgate. Jerome said that in the Greek mind, there were 153 species of fish. So this symbolized how the gospel should be shared with everyone, everywhere. Three interesting interpretations. But I think it's just a basic thing that John is saying here. There were 153 literal fish that they caught. And a few points to remember. 
This was a real event that John saw firsthand. He was there and he witnessed it. And also if it reflects or means anything to these disciples about their future ministry, there's going to be a lot of hard work that they need to be ready for as they go out and preach the gospel. And then Jesus gives this invitation to them in verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you knowing that it was the Lord? Nobody wanted to be Captain Obvious and point it out or even ask a question. Jesus came and he took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is Jesus' last meal with his disciples we read about in the Gospels. And then in verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, then to the disciples without Thomas, then with Thomas. So his third appearance to the disciples, his fourth appearance within the Gospel of John. And as we wrap up these last few verses here, we're learning and seeing that when we operate in God's direction, we enjoy a deeper fellowship with him. These disciples, because they were obedient to Jesus, because they listened to his instructions, they got to get their fish and come to land, and they got to enjoy a meal with Jesus. Not only that, they learned to be dependent on him. And they enjoyed a deeper, more meaningful relationship with him because of the lesson they have just learned. John Calvin, in his commentary on these passages, points out, God permitted them to toil no purpose during the whole night in order to prove the truth of the miracle. For if they had caught anything, what followed immediately afterwards would not have so clearly manifested the power of Christ. But when after having toiled ineffectually during the whole night, they are suddenly favored with a large take of fishes, they have good reason for acknowledging the goodness of the Lord. Because of their need and Jesus meeting that need, they enjoy a deeper fellowship with him, a deeper relationship with him. And it's important for us because our struggles and our sufferings lead us into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. When our marriage is struggling and it's easy to call it quits and just give up, we know God's word says to stick with it and that God hates divorce except for in a few small circumstances. We learn to rely on him to get through it. When we're struggling with our finances and we have tight bills and we're not sure how to make it, but we still faithfully give to God's church and God's ministries, we'll learn and see how he shows up in those situations. Maybe if someone goes to college and they thought it was a good decision and they're working through it, but they can't pay their bills or they're struggling to get everything done and manage their family, God will show them how to get through it. Jeremy Camp is a modern musician you might have heard of. He has a lot of songs on the radio. And he has a unique story where he got married at the age of 22. Less than 100 days later, his wife died of stomach cancer. Can you imagine being a widow at age 22? And he wrote a memoir years ago that I read. There's been a movie that was created. I haven't seen the movie, but I read his memoir titled I Still Believe. He writes about that experience of his wife dying at such a young age. He says, enduring suffering comes down to having and maintaining an eternal perspective. That's not an easy truth to hear during suffering, because it certainly doesn't seem like our troubles are achieving anything at the time. But suffering is temporary. He writes, I certainly didn't feel that way during my period of suffering, but I learned over time that it's true. The suffering that God has walked through with me has refined me. It hasn't defined me. I'm not the guy whose wife passed away who has a powerful testimony. He writes, but it has refined me and deepened my dependence on God. Suffering digs to the very core of your soul and it tests you far below the shallowness of who you previously thought God was. 
Suffering asks, are you really going to trust the Lord? Are you really going to worship the Lord? Are you really going to still serve him? Yes can be the only answer to those questions. When you've been taken to a depth where you can understand and truly know who God is, to where you can experience personally who he says he is in the Bible, and then have to walk in that truth. When we follow God's direction, we, it means we learn to depend on him more. We learn to rely on him more. We usually learn to search his word more. I want to end with a, a story. I've told a version of this story before. And there are two stories of water leaking through my garage. So if I ever tell another story, that's a different one. But my wife and I, we bought our first house in 2016. And as new homeowners, you're still learning how things work and where things are at and where your water's turn off is and all those things. You probably know where I'm going already. And one Sunday afternoon after church, I heard a hissing sound in our garage. So I walk out in the garage and I see up in the corner some water coming through the ceiling into the garage. Not good. So I go outside and I see that the sprinkler valves, which were above ground there, one of them had popped off the top of the sprinkler valve. And so water is shooting straight up. It's hitting the overhang of the house, which is slanted, and it happens to be hitting right where there is a vent into the attic. So the water is going straight up, hitting the slant. It's bouncing straight into the vent, going into the attic, and now into the garage. Not good, right? So I go to the outside of the house where there's a valve, of course, conveniently located, and I grab the valve, and it turns much too easily which means it's broken. You can feel nothing's grabbing. So the valve outside the house doesn't work. So then what do I got to do? I got to go find the shutoff at the street. And at this place, it was in the lawn, which means it's buried under a bunch of dirt. There's all kinds of roots in there. I'm getting all dirty and I do not like to get dirty. And then I finally get to the valve cover and I uncover it and there's more dirt in the box. So I'm digging it out, and then I finally find the little valve, a little one-inch valve, that of course is halfway rusted shut. And I'm trying my best to turn it, but I can't get it to turn. I'm covered in water and mud and dirt, and a lady from church had had knee surgery, so she would ride her tricycle every afternoon around our neighborhood. And she said, what are you doing? As I'm about to cry, <laughs> I said, well, I can't get the valve shut, and the water is going to ruin our house, and our apartment we had in Texas, it burnt to the ground. This one's going to get soaked to the ground and ruined, you know. I'm like, <clears throat> she goes, well, I'll call my husband. He'll come help you. And her husband I had known from church, he drove a Shelby GT Mustang hot rod. He had an office job. He doesn't do construction. I know him. He had a steady diet of coca-cola and ice cream you know his only exercise was running the remote i knew this guy sweet guy but i wasn't really expecting a whole lot of help so he shows up of course and his hot roddy it was a good excuse to drive fast so he drives right over there and he gets out and he's already huffing and puffing we haven't even done anything <laughs> like this guy's gonna have a heart attack on my property trying to just you know fix this so he says oh yeah I got something to fix that. And he goes, he pops his trunk, and he gets the biggest pipe wrench I'd ever seen in my life. He sticks that baby in there, and then he screws it on there tight so it's not coming off. And he just turns it right off, shuts the water off. Now, funny story, but there is a purpose to the story. Trying to turn that valve under my own strength as hard as I could was never going to work. But once I got a little help from someone else with the right tools and followed his instructions, it worked. Guess what the first thing I did that week was? Go buy my own big old pipe wrench. See, when we seek God's direction in life, life is much easier because we can accomplish what he wants in our lives. And in that process, we learn to rely on him and to depend on him. And because of that, we enjoy a deeper fellowship with him. Let's pray.
God, thanks for your word that reminds us who you are, that you are loving and caring, that you don't ignore the things going on in our lives. Even though we suffer and we go through pain, sometimes those are lessons we're learning to rely on you more, to search you more. We know we never come to a full understanding of who you are, but we are growing each and every day. We have faith in you that seeks understanding of you. And I pray for our church that I know they're going through tough times. They're experiencing those questions of, God, are you real? Are you there? Do you know? Please help. I pray for our church that you would help us to rely on you and depend on you and that you would show yourselves to us in those unique situations. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'll invite the guys to come up. We're